of God. Who has a word from the Lord direct from the throne room. Be seated in, in his presence and listen. For these are the days of new beginning. These are the days of the moving forth of my presence, saith the Lord. And yea, I am walking in thy midst. I am walking through these aisles even now. For even this night, saith the Lord, I have called thee here by divine appointment. And I will speak unto thee concerning my purpose and concerning destiny, saith the Lord. For yea, this night I will send forth an anointing even in this place that will begin to charge thee and prepare thee even for the decade of the 90s, saith the Lord. For it will be an anointing that shall increase, saith the Lord. And yea, you're going to see the move of my spirit, for even in this hour, saith the Lord, there is even now a transfer. For even in this hour, I am beginning to raise up now generals and men and women that will begin to go forth in my name. And I call thee here tonight to be eyewitnesses of that which I am about to bring forth. For it is the day of the pouring forth of my presence, saith the Lord. And even as I began with the people in the turn of this century, and even as I begin to move even on Azusa Street, yea, even I'm going to move in your midst, but yea, the glory of the latter house shall be greater than that of the former, saith the Lord. And yea, it shall be the hour that yea, Cushai shall begin to run and begin to carry the baton, saith the Lord. For yea, I am now beginning to raise up a people that is going to begin to close this century and open up another century in a new order and a new glory like you've never seen. For this is the night, saith the Lord, that I choose to move even in thy midst. And yea, you're going to see the cloud of glory moving in third world nations. And yea, I'll begin to bring voices out of that land and out of those places. And you will begin to see the day that the oppressed shall carry my gospel and my name. For I call thee here tonight to be eyewitnesses of that which I'm about to bring forth. For yea, this is just the seed. For yea, this is just the beginning. And out of this shall many come forth, saith the Lord. And many movements and many streams, saith the Lord. For even tonight I begin to do a work by my spirit. So the Spirit of the Lord would say unto thee, Lift up holy hands in my presence, for I send an anointing for you to go through the decade of the 90s. And I begin to anoint thee to cross over, for the baton is in thine hand. Run with it. Run with it. Run with it. And let it spread throughout the world. For it is a new day. It is a new beginning. And the charge has been given unto thee, saith the Spirit of the living God. Sing it all the glory. Come on. The next voice you hear will probably one that will still be ringing very possibly at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I met him here on the campus of the Old Roberts University over 15 or 16 years ago. He's well educated, but he had Jesus when he came here and had a vision when he came here. And we used to sit and talk about his dreams and visions and aspirations, which he is presently realizing building probably the largest and most commanding full gospel or charismatic church in the whole Caribbean waters and is a recognized leader held with great respect from the prime minister of the country in which he lives throughout the islands of the seas and the nations of the world he happens to be one of my dearest and closest friends I keep a picture of he and his family in my house and I pray for them every time I look at it it's an invisible place I love Miles. God has spoken to him. God speaks through him. Look at the person next to you and say, get ready to hear from heaven. And say, this is not something simple. You'll have to listen with the intelligence of the Holy Spirit. Touch your ears right now, both of them. Say, be anointed to hear. Touch your heart and say, be anointed to receive. In the name of Jesus, lift up your hands. Miles Monroe, come. May the Lord use you and the Lord bless you right now. 
Say, God bless, God bless your servants your servant. to our hearts. In Jesus' name. Give him a big hand. Will you, Miles Mayo? Praise God. Amen. Amen. Well, good evening. I thought I never was going to get up here. <laughs> but I'm so glad I waited on the ministry of Sister Power. What a blessing. I would like to bring you greetings from the islands of the sea, the people in the third world regions. I bring you greetings in the name of Jesus, who is his highest, the majesty of this kingdom that we are part of. Bring you greetings from my wife, who I love so much. I love my wife so much that it hurts. I do. I called her as soon as I landed in Tulsa a few hours ago, went to my hotel room. She was always on my mind. Just like a call. Just called to tell her I love her. I love her with all my heart, my soul, my liver, my pancreas. <laughs> I do. Amen. We've been married now for, this is our 11th year. We have two beautiful children God has blessed us with. And I am so thankful that God has given me a tremendous helpmate. Thank God for a beautiful wife. So she told me to give her greetings to you and to Pastor Carlton and Helen and Gary and Debbie and Ron and all the others who have been such a blessing to us. I want you to know that it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, I had to really do a lot to get here, change a lot of schedules and hop a lot of planes, but it's a pleasure to be in the will of God. And uh, if I was home with my wife tonight, with my two children, I would have been out of the will of God. So, I am in the right place, at the right time, with the right people, to hear the right word from the only God. I give respect to all of the men and women who carry the banner in the church, the leaders, respect you, give you regards, encourage you to be faithful. Don't ever live by what you see. Tonight, I hope you heard the prophecy. I really hope you heard the prophecy. The prophetic utterance that came through our brother Jordan, uh, it's very serious. And I almost, I almost said, God, I might as well just give the benediction. But before I was born, I was supposed to be here.
this meeting tonight now I don't know about last night I wasn't here I don't know about the night before I wasn't here but this one thing I know this meeting tonight is a setup <laughs> and I mean it God set this up before we were born the scripture says God does all things by predestination Predestination means you set the destination before you start the journey. So he predestined all things, it says, all things, according to his purpose. So Dr. All Roberts had to build this building before we got here tonight. This was built for tonight. The tailor that made my suit had to make it before I bought it for me to wear it tonight. And no matter where you was or could have been, you had to be here tonight and so I don't waste God's time he doesn't waste my time we don't want to waste your time so we are here to do business I'm so glad you kept your appointment with me. According to the, the brochure for this conference, tonight Dr. Bensonita Hoser would have been speaking. He's a great man of God. I was minding my own business. <laughs> I was. And I got this phone call from Tulsa. And I was rudely interrupted by a gentleman who indicated that he felt that this is where I should be tonight. I prayed because I'm a very busy man and my heart is really in the third world nations. So coming north has to be an assignment not an invitation for me. So I am here on an assignment that separates me from just a speaker. I I am so afraid tonight because what I am pregnant with I have been pregnant with for two years God did not allow me to deliver the baby but tonight he told me to deliver the baby. Can you hold hands with your neighbor? This is very dangerous. 
I need agreement from the Holy Ghost. Gracious Father, before I speak, you have already said, here I am. So tonight I stand on the threshold of two generations. And I thank you for the privilege of trusting me. Thank you for your confidence in me to handle not only your word, but your precious people. I honor and I carefully handle this evening. Thank you, Father, for setting this up. All the planning. Now speak to us. Some of us came because it's vacation. But they are wrong. Some came because it sounds like fun. They are wrong. Some are here because they were here last year. But tonight, Lord, it's different. The hands that we hold, we hold in great awe and fear that we will not miss what you say. For history is in this room tonight. Thank you, Father. Squeeze the hand a little bit. Get your Bibles with me. So good to see you obeying God tonight. My life is very short. I don't have much time on earth. So one thing I am very conscious of is time because I don't have time to waste. So every minute of my life I have come to cherish and everything I do with that minute has become a priority. And so I am very careful who I am with all the time and what I'm saying. I would like to share with you on the power of purpose. I want you to take notes tonight, especially those of you who are still not sure why you're here. The power of purpose. Don't miss it. I was flown in here by God. To share and to deposit with you something that you will not be the same after you hear it. I guarantee you that no one in this room will be challenged by God. But you will be changed. Today, I stand here with great fear in my heart. A fear that is generated by an acute sensitivity to the time we are spending together here and right now. I am very sensitive to this time. Why? Because we are spending precious time tonight, minutes, seconds, and hours together. We are spending time that we will never see again. And we will never be able to recover the time that we are spending here tonight. Therefore, we better make sure that what we do in this time is worth eternity. 
The greatest tragedy in life is wasted time and wasted potential. The wealthiest place on the face of this planet, I have come to conclude, is, is not the gold mines of South Africa or the diamond mines of Johannesburg. The wealthiest place on this planet is not the oil fields of Iran. It's not the uranium deposits around the world. The wealthiest place on this planet Earth is not the silver streaks in the mountains. The wealthiest place on this planet today is the cemetery. For in the cemetery is buried dreams, goals, ideas, inventions, aspirations, visions, songs, music, artwork, inventions that never came to be. People died pregnant. The, graves, the graveyard is so rich that if we were to mine them, the world would change overnight. I believe that there is somebody in the graveyard who had the cure for AIDS, but they didn't believe they did. Just suppose Michelangelo died with the Sistine Chapel in his mind. Just suppose Tchaikovsky died with all that music in his mind. Just suppose Paul died with all those books in his mind. Just suppose Mary had an abortion. got a question for you. Will you contribute to the wealth of the graveyard? Will you die with your dream, your vision, your ideas? Will you die with your purpose? Tonight, many are sitting here in this building who are about to commit abortion. They're about to miscarry. They're about, they are about to terminate their vision. I've come to tell you, don't do that. The dream that you're pregnant with. The vision that have you so stirred up. And the ideas that God has planted in your mind. Please don't miscarry. I stand here as a marked man. I feel so afraid. God has so deposited me here. And I'm afraid that if you miss what is said, you would have committed an abortion. I want you to get your Bibles and turn to the most exciting book to me. It's the book of Genesis. Chapter 1. Listen to me carefully. The only thing worse than death is life without a reason. I will repeat myself. 
The only thing worse than death is life without purpose. It is better to be dead and not have to worry about living than to live and not know why. You see, everyone here knows why they are here. Let me correct that. I'm not sure. Let me say it this way. Everyone here today knows where they are. Yes? And everybody here today hopefully knows what they are. I mean, you know you're female, I, sh I hope. Are you sure you're male? Some ain't sure today. So you know exactly where you are, you know exactly what you are, and everyone here knows exactly how they got here. Some by bus, some by plane, some drove their cars, but you know exactly how you got here. So you know where you are and who you are and how you got here. But my question that I'm concerned about tonight is do you know why you are here? The greatest question in life is not what, but why. Until this question is answered, there can never be personal, corporate, or national fulfillment. I will repeat. Until the question why is answered, there can never be personal, corporate, or national fulfillment. Therefore, I have concluded after 21 years in the ministry that the most important question in life is why. If you don't know the why for anything, you are in trouble. You know, Shakespeare gave us an example of a man who didn't know why. In one of his plays, we studied in college and, and in high school, and he, he makes a statement that describes a person who doesn't know why. And it goes like this. Life is but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. You know what he really means? What he means is, there's a guy up there making a lot of noise, but ain't saying nothing. Doing a lot of action, but ain't going nowhere. He's signifying nothing. The Holy Ghost spoke to my heart recently and said to me, the church is busy but not effective. Thank you, Lord. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. But I want to read a verse of scripture that you never saw before. It's verse zero. Turn to your Bible. It is there. It's right there. You see it by faith. Believe me. I'm going to read it for you. And if you, if you don't have it in your Bible, you can write it in. It goes like this. Before there was a beginning, there is God. That's verse zero in the Bible. That means God did not begin when the beginning began. He began the beginning. So God didn't start when start got started. God started start. So don't ever lock God into the Bible. God is bigger than the beginning. As a matter of fact, the beginning came out of him.
Therefore, God is outside of time because he started time. Time is an interruption in eternity. Write it down. Good definition. Therefore, do not judge God according to your experience. Uh, one day, Peter got a revelation of this and he got confused. Peter says, do you know a day with the Lord could be a thousand years? That means if God tells you, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> that could be a long time. The point he was trying to make is God is bigger than the beginning. He's outside of time. So God began the beginning when the beginning began. And before there was a beginning, there is God. That means before there was anything, there is God. Do you know if you run into God on the highway of nothing by the corner of nowhere and shook his hands, you'd be shaking hands with everything? True. Everything that is, was in God. Say it with me. Bible says before anything came to be there is God and all things were made by him so if you run into God when there was nothing you'd be running into everything now I want you to turn to Ecclesiastes with me chapter to one You all ready to go swimming with me? We're not wading into the water tonight. We're jumping overboard in the ocean. Because I got to deliver this baby and you might as well sit till the baby comes. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2. One of the saddest verses in the Bible. Now before you read it, those of you who are theological scholars and try to impress people by your big words, uh, let me just sort of appease you a minute. The book of Ecclesiastes is not to be taken literally. You know that. It is what they call a sarcastic piece of literature, full of sarcasm. It's written actually in the positive, but it means the negative. It's really a commentary on man's foolishness. It sort of teases man. It exposes man's total ineptness to be anything. It shines light on man's accomplishments and proves that they are nothing. They are empty. In the King James Version, the word vanity is used. In the New International Version, the word meaningless is used. Uh, let's just read verse 2, for example. It says, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What a way to start a book. <laughs> he goes on to talk about how meaningless life can be. Let's look at chapter 2, verse 4. I undertook great projects. Whenever you find your name in this verse, just say, ouch. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself. I planted a vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female servants, that means staff people. I had some born in my own house. I also owned more herds and flocks, that means investments, borns, stocks. In our day, that would, that's what that would be. I had more than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women and singers and a harem as well, the delights of my heart, which is of, of, of the heart of all men. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. Read verse 10. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. 
My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward of all my labor. I worked hard to get this, he said. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done, and when I looked at what I toiled to accomplish, everything was meaningless. Everything was chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Now, you got to appreciate this guy. He had everything you are trying to get. He's trying to save you the problem. He's saying, look, if you're going after that stuff, let me give you a little secret. Ain't nothing at the end of it. It's meaningless. Some of you are already there. Now, what is the problem with this writer? What is he trying to say? He's saying it's meaningless. That means when you get it, you understand that there's no reason to it. See, he knew what he had, but he couldn't figure out why he had it. Listen to me tonight. You see, the greatest thing about what is why. Write it down. The greatest thing about what is why. Without why, what is meaningless? Why gives what fulfillment? I have concluded that the most important thing in life to find out is why. Let me define why for you. Write this down. Why is purpose. Why is purpose? Why are we here? Why did God call this conference? Why did you come? Why all this investment in time and money and resources and people? Why all the travel documents and all the tickets bought? Why all the gasoline? Why all the time and the money and why all the energy? Why all the rent and why? See, what is not important if you can't figure out why? Why did God call this conference? I was coming here for two weeks. Just asking why. Boy, do I know why. The theme to this conference is interesting. Let the fire fall. Sounds great. Came from a scripture from the book of Kings. Praise God, Elijah. Everybody know that? Exciting, isn't it? Let the fire fall. And it's a great theme. Let the fire fall. But I got a serious question to ask. Why do you want this fire to fall? See, it isn't the what that's important. Hear me tonight. We're dealing with the basic now. Why should the fire fall in the first place? What was the purpose for Elijah's fire? It might not be the purpose for this one. I was sent here. Don't look at the pastor. Look at me. I don't need his approval. I'm sent here by God. I came 2,000 miles over the ocean to see you tonight. One night. I'm leaving in the morning. I got no time to waste.
Why should fly, fire fall? That's a serious question. It's so easy to follow themes. They just sound good. Man, life is too short to waste, brother. We got to find out why. You know, let me give you an example. Let the fire fall. Do you know fire can be used for a whole lot of things? For example, why should we let the fire fall? Why should it come? It could come for destruction. Fire burns things up. It could come for warming and comfort. That means keep us warm in our religiosity that we are in already. The fire can come for cooking. That means we just have potluck dinners again. Feed ourselves spiritual food. Or should the fire come for refinement? Or it could come for light. To bring light and darkness. There's a whole lot of reason why fire could come. I, I want you to ask yourself a question. Why do we want the fire to fall? If you came here for a good time, you missed the point. This de decade and destiny is too crucial for good times. Why do we want the fire to fall? Well, first of all, let's find out where we got that from. We got that from Elijah. His experience with the pagans. The purpose for Elijah's fire, I will repeat, the purpose for Elijah's fire was not refinement, it was not for warming, it was not for cooking, it was not for light, it was not even for destruction of people. It was for demonstration and testimony. That's all it was. Now, is that what God wants now? Don't answer it. Think about it. I don't think that the fire that God called this conference to get is for demonstration. You got enough of that. So why do we want this fire to fall? What fire do we want to fall? These are tough questions, man. Just never thought about it, huh? Let the fire fall. Wait a minute. What fire? And why? What exactly is in God's mind? Well, let me ask the final question. For what purpose does God want the fire to fall? God does nothing without a purpose. Start writing. God does nothing without a purpose. This meeting is not held for the fun of it. I'm going to give you seven principles before I take you into trouble. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. It's a very powerful verse of scripture. It's, it's a truth that is capsulized. You need to read it. Proverbs chapter 20, chapter 19, verse 21. It says this. It says, many are the plans in a man's heart. But it is the Lord's purposes that will prevail. Now, when I read that the first time, I, I really didn't understand. 
I pondered that for years. Here I go again. Many are the purposes in a man's heart. Many are the plans that a man makes. But it is the Lord's purposes that prevail. That means you can plan all you want. You can do all your scheming and your dreaming, your strategizing, all of your analysis and your feasibility studies and go through all the stuff. And when you finish, God says, I ain't going to quit until I get what I want. Let me tell you how serious that is. God is saying, look, let me get something straight with you. If you don't do what I want done, I'll wait for your children. That's what he means. My purpose is going to be done. If you don't do it in your generation, I am not in time. I could wait. You got to hear me tonight. You are at a point in history where God is asking a question. Are we going to go with this? Or am I going to wait for the children? That's where we are tonight. That's why I've come to warn you that if you do not move this time, he'll wait for the children. He did it in the promised land. Not a one minute except the few. And he says, I'll wait for the children. Why? I'm not in time. I got all the time in the universe. God does not think in terms of individuals. He thinks in terms of generations. You're part of something big. He says, make your plans, but you better find out my purpose first. Do you know something? It is sad. What he's really saying is, you can make your plans and go through all of your work, and in the end, you miss it. Because you didn't do what I intended you to do. There are people who went to college and studied four years, and went through all of that work, and in the end, God told them, that's not what I wanted you to do. And they wasted four good years. What God is really trying to say is, before you plan, find the purpose. Oh, please hear me. The best way to waste time is to not know purpose. Why? That's the question. It would be sad, all the work that the Ministry of Health did, higher dimensions, all the work of the choir practicing all night, all the work of all the committees, all the advertisement and thousands of dollars that went in on the television and all the different print media, all that stuff, and we still haven't figured out why are we having this thing? Now this is a tough question. But it's going to be okay tonight. Because I got the baby. You don't know how pregnant I feel. Well, Holy Spirit is ministering to me for the last two years. It's just almost too awesome to even think about. I want to give you a definition of purpose. Purpose. Purpose is the original intent for the creation of a thing that was in the mind of the creator of the thing. I will repeat. Purpose is the original intent for the creation of a thing that was in the mind of the creator of the thing. Purpose then, basically, in essence, is the reason for the creation of a thing. That's purpose. Purpose then is the why for a thing. So now I'm going to give you seven principles that are going to change your life. 
Don't miss this and teach this to your children's children. Number one, God is a God of purpose. Write it down. God is a God of purpose. God does nothing without a purpose. God does nothing for the fun of it. Everything God does has a purpose. God is a God of purpose. Say it with me. Come on, sit up straight. Straighten your shoulders. Say it with me. God is a God of purpose. That means he does nothing without a purpose. The scriptures teach it from Genesis to Revelation that God does all things according to his purpose. How many things? All. That means everything has a purpose. That leads me to my second principle. Nothing in life is without purpose. Write it down. Nothing in life is without purpose. Nothing. Now say it with me. Nothing in life is without purpose. There's a purpose for the roach. There's a purpose for the mosquito. There's a purpose for the ant. There's a purpose for the maggot. There's a purpose for the snake. There's a purpose for the lice. There's a purpose for the fly and the bumblebee and the shark and the fish. There's a purpose for the lion. There's a purpose for everything. There's a purpose for the hair in your nose. There's a purpose for the hair under your arm that you shave off. There's a purpose for everything. God knew what he was doing and he gave everything a purpose. This is serious. Say it with me. Everything in life. Has a, has a purpose. Say with me, nothing in life, nothing in life is, without purpose. is without purpose. Third principle. Not every purpose is known. Ah. I will repeat. Not every purpose is known. Now we've got to relate that to all the others. One, God is a God of purpose. Two, Everything in life has a purpose. Three, but not every purpose is known. Now, you've got you to gotta understand this. Everything has a purpose. God made nothing without a purpose. But not every purpose is known. That's dangerous. You know why we kill rats and mice? Do you know why we kill roaches? We don't really know their purpose. <laughs> That's not funny. Those of you in this room today who are scientists in the field of ecology, you know what I'm talking about. There are animals that we killed off because we didn't know their purpose until it was too late. And it messed up the ecosystem. Now we're trying to conserve and preserve and reserve to try and save some so we could keep the balance. Why? God put them in there for a proper purpose. Every animal, every plant has a purpose. There's a purpose for cocaine. Don't get nervous. Look at your faces. Oh my God, he's going to sell drugs now. <laughs> oh, listen to me carefully. God created everything. Can I get an amen at least? Yeah. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that exists. Amen? So, all things were made by him. How many? All. all. If he made all, who made the rest? So God created marijuana. Come on, don't get nervous. Say yes. God created cocaine. Come on, say yes. Lord, they saying it on television. God created tobacco. Yes. Come on, say it like you believe it. Yes. 
You should see your face, man. God created alcohol. Yes. Wow. Wow. Now, we know God created everything. And everything has a purpose, but not every purpose is known. So I lead you to my fourth principle, where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. Please write it down. Where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. That means if you don't know the purpose for a thing, all you can do is abuse it. Now let me clear something real quick. The Holy Spirit showed me and then I had to go, of course, into my British grammar to decipher this revelation. Everybody say abuse. abuse. I want you to write the word down. Abuse. Now I'm going to take you back to the original foundation of that one word. It's made up of two words. Now the British language is the original foundation for the English language that you speak here in America. And of course, coming from a British colony, you know, uh, we, we had to learn all the original stuff. You know, jolly well old chap coming out now, fella. You know, we had to learn the stuff, you know what I mean? So we had to learn the real English grammar. And one thing they did was they, they, they spelt words out completely. But then as the language progressed, it changed and it became lazy. The Americans helped with that. And they began to squash words. Instead of saying, I am not coming, we'd say, I ain't coming. <laughs> Instead of saying, all of you, we say, y'all. You know, we just squash it. But that's what happened to this word. Now, the word abuse, say it with me, abuse. It came from two words, abnormal use. They put the two words together and it eventually lost many of the letters. Abnormal use. Abnormal use. Abuse. Abuse. That's where it came from. Where purpose is not known, abnormal use is inevitable. The implication is profound. Wherever there is abnormal use, there has to be a normal use. Have you noticed that the term they use when someone abnormally uses uh, any kind of drug, they don't use the term that it is bad. They call it abuse. You didn't get that. They never say cocaine is bad. They never say marijuana is bad or alcohol is bad. What they say is it is being abused, abnormally used. That means there's a normal use for it. When you go to the hospital for an operation and they got to give you surgery, they, they put the stuff in you. Some of you had cocaine, didn't know it. They put that stuff in you to kill the pain. Some of you had morphine. Some of you had all kind of caffeine and terphene and all kind of fiend. <laughs> when you go to the dentist and you got to do a root canal, he shoves drugs up your gum so you can't feel the pain. And then you come out of the, out of the dentist and hmm, there's a drug addict. A, see that, that move, them young people, they ain't no good. They're taking drugs. You just had drugs. The difference between yours and theirs is that yours was normally used and theirs being abnormally used. Now follow me. Where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. That creates some big problems because not every purpose is known. And if you don't know the purpose of something, you will abuse it. God put the cocaine in the cocoa plant for a purpose. 
medical science have discovered a way to extract and to define its purpose. And so they use it under medical care and attention, and it is called medicine. So when they give it to you in the hospital, they call it medication. But if you don't know the purpose for it, then you will abnormally use it, and instead of calling it medication, they call it drug abuse. Paul told Timothy, uh, you have a problem with your stomach, take some alcohol, that's the normal use, as medication. That means if you don't have a tummy ache, you don't need it. How many of you ever heard of Geritol? Let me see your hands. <laughs> All right. Do you know that Geritol has the same amount of alcohol as some of the basic liquor you buy? And some of you acting so holy, you're taking Geritol? <laughs> Check the box. 2% alcohol, enough to get you drunk if you drink it. But if you look at the box, it tells you how to normally use it. One tablespoon or two tablespoons a day. That's it. Why? That's the normal use. You take Tylenol home and they tell you two tablets a day. That's it. That's the normal use. It will bless you if you take it normally. But if you take the whole bottle, they call it drug abuse. Hello. So the most important thing in life to discover about anything is its purpose. Otherwise, you'll abuse it. Now let me get off drugs a little bit and bring it home a little bit closer. If you don't know the purpose for a thing, you will abuse it. Where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. That means if you don't know the purpose for a husband, don't touch one. And if you don't know the purpose for a wife, for heaven's sake, don't get married. Why? Because if you don't know the purpose for a thing, you will abuse it. You ever heard of wife abuse? You ever heard of husband abuse? That means the dummy doesn't know the purpose for the thing. Hit somebody and say, ouch. Where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. That means if you don't know the purpose for children, don't have them. You ever heard of child abuse? Child abuse is someone having a child but don't know what children are for. Some people don't know the purpose for a job. Amen. There's job abuse. Amen. Go to work late, leave early, and take long lunches. It's job abuse. Some people only go to, to a job to get paid. That's not the purpose for a job. The purpose for a job is work, not pay. I'm going to repeat it. The purpose for a job is work, not pay. If I had the time, I'd prove that from Scripture. The first thing God gave Adam is work, not a wife, work. Verse 15, he gave him work. Then in verse 18, he gave him a woman. That means the man should have work before he get a wife. Amen. And no woman should marry a man who ain't working. That's God's order of things. Adam had a job before Eve showed up. Check it in scripture. So if he say you love, he loves you and you are the beautifulest thing he ever saw, just ask him, you work it? Don't get him, don't let him snow you. Yeah, get the basic question down. Hallelujah. 
Where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. You know, I'm afraid, I really am tonight, because I'm not sure if we know the purpose for our generation. And if you don't know the purpose for something, it's called generation abuse. I did a series of teachings, I'm still working on it. It's taken me almost three months, still every day I'm teaching it. God pour over my heart. I, God asked me a question. He says, where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable, right? I said, yes, sir. He says, then what is the purpose for the church? And I couldn't answer. If I was here for a week, I'd give you some of what I discovered, the purpose of the church. And the purpose for the church is not what we've been doing. For hundreds of years, we've been off. So we've been, it's called church abuse. Let me tell you something that ministered to me. The Holy Spirit says, Jesus, my son. Jesus was a man who wasted no time. Why? From day one he knew his purpose. From age 12 he told his dad, his mama, woman, let me tell you something. I know why I'm here. And every morning he woke up, he knew exactly what he was about. He did not experiment with life. When you don't know your purpose, all you can do is experiment. And most of you are experimenting, trying this, trying that, trying this, changing that, doing this. And God's saying, but time is going, kid. The years are flying by. You're wasting time. Find your purpose. You know something? It is sad. It's possible to do something good that is wrong for you. Why? Your purpose is not known. Abuse is inevitable. You don't know the purpose for a car? Don't buy one. Don't know the purpose for clothes? Don't buy any. If you don't know the purpose for a pastor, please leave him alone. That's serious. I have seen so much pastor abuse, it is terrible. If I were to ask you right now, what is the purpose for a pastor, 90% of you cannot tell me. Guaranteed. You think you can, you just assume it. The purpose for a pastor is not to visit hospitals. It's not to come and dedicate your house. I can show you from the Bible. The purpose for the pastor is not to win souls. Come on. The Bible says, I've set in the church apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers to train the people to work the ministry. You are abusing the pastor. It's called pastor abuse. You're just as bad as a drug abuser. Some pastors can't fulfill their vision because they're too busy taking care of your hospital calls. It's called pastor abuse. When the pastor sends one of the saints to minister to you, that's proper. But you don't want to see the saint, you want to see the pastor. It's wrong. It's abuse. It's ungodly. Sit up straight. Sit up straight. Don't get nervous on me. If you don't know the purpose for money, Please leave it alone. Principle number five. If you want to know the purpose for a thing, never ask the thing. Saints, I studied this thing in the Word for years. What I'm telling you is so true and simple. 
I'll say it again. If you want to know the purpose for anything, don't ask the thing. See this equipment over here? <laughs> I'm going to ask this piano why it exists, all right? Just hang on a minute. Check, see if it could tell me. Oh, great lustrous piano, thou great and worthy piano. <laughs> For what purpose do you exist? <laughs> well, let's use something more electrical that's more advanced. Maybe it has more sense than this piano. Oh, great cog from Germany. For what purpose do you exist? Doesn't answer. Now, mics always talk. Let's see. <laughs> Great microphone. For which purpose do you exist? <laughs> that seems ridiculous, doesn't it? That's exactly what we've been doing with our own lives. Asking everybody else why we are here. Science is one great attempt to find out why. And all they keep coming up with is what? They know exactly what something is. We've got young people asking young people why they exist. So we have gangs. Aimless without direction. We got governments asking governments why they exist. So they're disillusioned. Uh, let me give you a number six. Principle. Purpose is only found in the mind of the creator of a thing. And this is awesome. Purpose is only found in the mind of the creator of a thing. That means only the maker of a thing knows its true purpose. Everyone else is guessing. Nobody knows Ford like Ford. Nobody knows Toyota like Toyota. Nobody knows Mercedes like Mercedes. If you buy a Mercedes and take it to Toyota for repairs, you are in trouble. <laughs> because only the manufacturer of a thing knows its true purpose. Only the manufacturer has genuine parts. Purpose is only found in the mind of the maker of a thing. You know, I've discovered something very simple in life. Every single thing in this room, including the dress on your back and the suit on your shoulders, has the name of the manufacturer. <laughs> everything. Let's look at it. Everything. Sure. Everything, call. Everything has, check your clothes, you see. <laughs> Pierre Cardin, private line. Check your shoes. Everything. That means the maker of a thing always puts his image on it. Why? He wants you to know where to go if you need parts or you got complaints. Or if you don't know the purpose for the thing, he wants you to know where to come find the purpose. Some of you are going to get this later. Everything, everything has the stamp of the manufacturer. Why? Because they want you to take it to no one else for repairs. Secondly, they want no one else to take the credit for their product. 
I ain't come to you yet. I'm just still talking about your clothes. So if you want to know the purpose for a thing, it's in the mind of the maker of it. North Carolina last week, I went into an antique store. I'll never forget the experience. Oriental antique store. Chinese, Korean, Japanese products. Beautiful antique stuff. I walked in the store and, and I was walking, browsing through, and I saw some beautiful little trinkets and some little bowls and nice things. And I said, wow, this would be great. We just bought a new house and my wife and I, you know, and we just started collecting stuff and, and I picked this stuff up and I picked up about three different articles and I said, now these would be great for soup. It's a bowl, you know, it's a, and this is great. This would look good for a, a, a figurine. You put a candle in this, man. This is a candle holder. And I said, oh, this thing, this is a stool. You sit on a beautiful little Japanese stool. So I called the attendant who was an oriental from the land. I said, uh, how much are these bowls? He said, they're not bowls. <laughs> Insulted me. He said, don't you ever call them bowls. They are ceremonial dishes only to be used at a Korean wedding. Then I said, sorry, what about this? He says, that is not a candle holder. That is a ceremonial lamp only to be used to burn incense at a certain ritual. I said, okay, what about the stool? That's not a stool. I said, but wait a minute, it, it's like a seat, it has no drawers, you, you know, you can sit on. He said, it's not a stool. He said, this is a tea table. Now watch this. I was wrong on every count. Learn a lesson. If you don't know the purpose of a thing, you will abuse it. I was going to take those dishes home and put soup in there. <laughs> I was going to take that ceremonial incense burner and put a candle in it. And I was going to sit on the table. <laughs> Do you understand? If you don't know the purpose of a thing, you will abuse it. Now watch this. There's no way I could have known. Put the creators of the thing. When I asked the creator of the thing, I got the real purpose. See, the table was real low, but you see, I forgot that in Japan they sit down on the floor. It's proper height for them. Ignorance. Abuse. If you want to know the purpose of a thing, never ask the thing. Ask the creator of the thing. Purpose is only found in the mind of the creator of a thing. And therefore, it leads me to my last principle in this segment. Purpose is the key to fulfillment. You can never fulfill the true purpose for a thing unless you know what it's for. Everything else is abuse. Now let me give you a, a quick analysis and then we're going to get to, the, to this final delivery. Everything that is bought, be it a refrigerator, a toaster, be it a microphone, be it a chairs, Peter, cassette player, television camera, whatever is bought, listen carefully, when you open the box, the first thing you see on top is a manual. Have you noticed? You buy a car, they give you a manual. Everything, refrigerator, they give you a manual. Why? Because, you see, that's, that's a serious thing. Manuals always come from manufacturers. You'll never find a Toyota manual in a Mercedes-Benz car. Because there's no use to you. 
So when you open the box, you see the manual, and here's something interesting. When you, when you look at the manual, right on the top of it, before you touch the equipment, it says on the manual, before opening this equipment, please read this manual completely first. You ever seen that? Every single one of you have never done it, most of you. Because you assume you know what this thing is for. Isn't that right? So you open up this thing and, and when, you, when you open the first page, there's a picture of it, right? And the picture has these little lines going to it, describing what the parts are, and it's sort of standing there. The image of the thing is there. Then page two, it tells you how to operate this equipment. And it lists all the functions and everything, how to operate it. Then you turn the page of the, of the manual, and there's another page, it tells you specifications of this equipment. That means if you want to replace parts, you must keep these specified uh, types of equipment and parts. Then the next page, it has warnings. And the warning would say, do not use equipment in open sunlight, do not use equipment near water, do not use equipment, you know, uh, near electrical circuits, etc. It gives you warnings. Then you turn the other page, and there's a beautiful little segment called Manufacturer's Warranty Guarantee. And there's fine print under that which says, if for any reason this equipment is malfunctioning, under normal use, the manufacturer commits to replace all parts free within the context of the warranty. True? Then it's another little fine print. If this equipment is used apart from the manufacturer's instructed operational manual instructions, this warranty is canceled. Some of you aren't even going to get this till I leave. <laughs> now why does the manufacturer have all that in this manual? Because he knows his equipment. And he knows how to make it maximize its performance. Now some of you got a video machine at home with 20 buttons, but you only know the purpose for three. <laughs> I got you. All you know is stop, play, rewind. <laughs> Why? Because you haven't discovered the purpose for the rest. So you wasted money. You have paid for something that you're not using. Because you don't know the purpose of it. Now I got good news for you. I came with a manual. And the manufacturer know my parts real good. Body, soul, spirit. He got them labeled. He tells you which each, what each part can do and how it can maximize its performance if it follows the manufacturer's operational instructions. He also has warnings in the manual which can sort short circuit the equipment. He also has manufacturer's warranty guarantees if I maintain it the way he says to do it. He also promises that he will cancel warranty if I violate manufacturer's instructions. Are you getting me? Not only that, he is so careful that you don't mistake where you came from, he stamped his image in me. So I should know exactly where I came from, so if I got questions about why, I know who to go to. We've been asking our neighbor, why am I here? Go to the manufacturer. We've been asking the preacher, why am I here? On every prayer line you show up, why am I here? Go to the manufacturer. He'll tell you. Got my manual. If 
you take the equipment to anyone other than the manufacturer, you have taken it to an unauthorized dealer. And that's what we've been doing all our lives. And the unauthorized dealer does not have genuine parts. Satan is an unauthorized dealer. He doesn't have the parts you're looking for. You know, if you go to an unauthorized dealer, sometimes the parts look so close to the real thing but it's off by a centimeter. And when they force it on your engine, it may run for a little while. But let me tell you something, honey. When that thing explodes, the whole thing is destroyed. I'm not against psychologists. I appreciate psychiatrists. I thank God for behavioral scientists. I too studied and got degrees. But I wonder if they got all the parts. <laughs> I'm going to let you think about it. No one could fix you emotionally like the manufacturer. No one could fix you physically like the manufacturer. No one could fix you psychologically like the manufacturer. I came with a manual. Now comes the big question then. What is the purpose for man? It asks the manufacturer. He created the thing. What's the purpose for the church? You can't even ask the seminary. I'm sorry, but that's it. You can't even ask the bishop. You cannot ask the pope the purpose for the church. You got to go to the maker of the thing. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I'm going to build this thing. It's his. If you want to know the purpose for the church, go ask the manufacturer. We got people graduating from seminaries who don't even know the manufacturer. And anybody who represents IBM without official status is called a, an imposter. Fraud. Are you getting my drift? Yes. There are people walking around representing the manufacturer and he never trained them. He never saw them. Then they, they never came to any of his seminars. I'm telling you from my heart, we got to get the purpose for this church right. Otherwise, we're going to abuse the time. Don't you get bored of those choruses? You can get quiet now, but that's okay. You get tired of singing the same old choruses. It's like there's no purpose behind this thing after a while. Is this all to it? Just fast choruses, slow songs, lift your hands, sing in tongues for five minutes, give the announcements, take up the offering. Give a nice little word from the Lord. Give a benediction. Lay hands on the sick. Everybody's laying the spirit. Get up. Go home. There's got to be more to it. Come on. Smile with me now. Come on. Don't. I ain't keep much longer, but come on. Be nice to me. Jump high, dance fast, swing around, land, and still don't know why you did it. <laughs> See, I, I don't have a problem with the what. But for heaven's sake and my sake, I want to know why. Jesus had a favorite statement. And I hope it's a statement that we can make more often. For this cause came I into the world. Can you hear it? For this cause. He knew the why. 
So the what made sense. You will not go home the same tonight. You're going to have a conference. Why? If you can't answer why, don't have it. That means God ain't spoke to you. So I better call them in the conference so we could have one out west or one down south. You better get it from the manufacturer. It's safer to do nothing and know why you're doing it than to do something and don't know why you're doing it. Listen, what is the purpose for the church? Well, I can't get into that. Uh, I told my office, I says, the message the Lord gave me is so rough, I need a week. So we bought some tapes out there, only a few, where we deal with the purpose for the church. And it will blow your mind. For example, if I ask you, what is the gospel? Some of you will say, the gospel is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what I thought too. And I did it for years. I asked someone else, what is the gospel? So, you must be born again, except a man be born again. That's what I thought too. It's not the gospel. I was in Curacao praying up in the hotel room and I had to go down in five minutes to speak to some of the top leaders throughout the whole third world. They were all together downstairs waiting for me. And I was praying and preparing and the Holy Ghost asked me a question. He says, what are you going to preach to them? I said, I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit said to me, that's your problem. I said, what do you mean? He says, that's the problem. You are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. Now you got to understand, I've been in this thing for a while, and that hurt my ego. And it messed with my theology. So I asked him, run that by me one more again. And the Holy Ghost says, you are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. So I had to go back to the Bible. And I, right there in the hotel room, I said, my God, let me, let me. and I started, looking, I started reading Matthew. The first thing I tried, Matthew chapter 4. Verse 17, first time Jesus showed up in public ministry, it says, And from that time he began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. And from then on, all I saw was the kingdom of God, 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 the kingdom of God. I said, Hold it, Holy Ghost. That ain't true, Holy Ghost. I rebuked the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and I said, We suppose the priest born again. Jesus preached born again. Holy Ghost said, Find it. So I went back to the Bible and let me prove you wrong, Holy Ghost. And I went and I looked, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, went back to Revelation, started over again. It's got to be somewhere in here where Jesus preached born again. And he never preached born again. Never. Don't throw your stones yet. I said, wait a minute. He never preached born again. As a matter of fact, he only mentioned it once. I can almost see your eyes. It's good. <sighs> That's exactly what happened to me. He only mentioned it once. And it was only to an old man in the middle of the night who woke him up. It's rough, isn't it, Ralph? So we've been preaching all the time, but Jesus never preached once. This is rough. I'm glad you came to Tulsa. And we've been preaching no time what he preached all the time. If I sat and asked you right now, any of you, tell me about the cross. 
Oh, you could really give me details, can't you? How long the thorns were, how big the nails were, what kind of wood it was of, how he was hung, how his hands were, how his legs were. You could describe the whole thing. Then I ask you the next question. Tell me about the kingdom. Calvary is a means to an end. The cross is a means to an end. I'm going to make a statement now, but I came here to make it. The Holy Spirit has shown me from the Word of God that Jesus ain't coming back right now. You might as well just relax. Get busy with the real stuff. I was reading Matthew chapter 24 a couple of years ago and he confirmed it right then to yourself. Matthew 24, it says, listen carefully, all right? You ain't going to believe this anyhow, but I'm going to read it anyhow. Matthew 24, verse 14, one that you always like to read. Please read it. All you theologues, come on, read it. Let's read it. And this gospel, verse 14, and this gospel, read it carefully, and this gospel, I got to be careful what you say now. This gospel of Calvary, this gospel of the resurrection, this gospel of born again. Is that what your Bible says? He says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. We're preaching everything else except what he said to preach. And he said he ain't gonna move until you do that. This is rough, isn't it? Destiny in the room tonight. Some of you gotta go take your theological discourses and dump them. Start over again with the New Testament. Just start reading the things. Say, God, show me the kingdom. Now, that's just a little glimpse into the purpose for the church. Let me ask another question. What is the purpose for nations? Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. What you're about to read is awesome. America is a great nation, but I'm afraid of it. I live outside of it so I could be more objective and I could see it so clearly. I'm afraid of it. I believe that every nation that is raised up was raised up for a specific purpose. God does nothing without a purpose. Let's read it. Acts chapter, four, chapter 17 verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needs anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. Read on. For one, from one man he made every nation of men. Why? That they should inhabit the whole earth. Why? And he determined the time set for them. That's important. He determines how long a nation will exist. And he also determines the exact places where they should live. He determines who will be a part of the nation. Some of y'all were shipped over on slave ships. But it was determined by God. You were supposed to be in this nation for such a time as this. And you wasn't going to come if he spoke to you because you was in darkness and witchcraft. So he had to bring you another way. You will understand this later. Verse 27, God did this, did what? He created the nations and put the people in certain places and certain times. Why? He did this purpose where they should live. He did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him. God created nations so that those nations could bring other people to him. That's it. Every nation God raised up is for the purpose of bringing people to God. 
The minute that nation starts doing the opposite, the nation starts to die. I told my prime minister, the president of my country the other day, I said, sir, we got a problem. We're not fulfilling our purpose. And it frightens me. To find Egypt today, you got to use a broom and a little spade. To find Rome today, you got to use a little airbrush to dig her up. Who do you think we are? We're no different. What's the purpose for a people? God does have purposes for people. Stay with me now. I'm coming to the meat. Everything has a purpose. All through scriptures, God says he formed a people for a reason. You ever seen that? Every people he has is for a reason. For what purpose did God form a people? I struggled with this for years. What is the purpose for this people? Now I need grace to explain to you what he showed me is the purpose for this people here tonight. May the Holy Spirit protect you from misconception and misperception and protect you from misunderstanding. The question has always been, why are we here? Something wonderful is happening all over the world. God is simply doing things with no one's permission. God is changing everything without anyone's consent. The season has come. The time has come. The world has five billion people on it. Eighty percent of them are non-white. Three and a half billion of those live in the third world. They are either Muslim, Buddhist, or Hindu, or animist, spirit worshippers, ancestral worshippers. God has now turned his face toward the third world. And he is raising up people that you do not know. I'm one of them. Wrong color, wrong height, wrong location. But it's time. Years ago, I heard prophecies from great men in your nation. And they prophesied about miracles happening, fire falling, as never before. And I listened to them for months prophesied, great names. And every time I listened to them, my heart began to weep. Because the Holy Spirit spoke to me and says, what they are saying is true. But where they expect it is wrong. He said, I will send tremendous miracles like never before. But they will be used not to entertain Christian babies. But they will be used to bring a Muslim and a Hindu and a Buddhist to God. Because that's what they need, a demonstration of fire. A pagan does not need a conference. A pagan cannot be warned with a seminar. They need to see the power of God. And this nation of America 
really has no pagans. It has rebellious people. A pagan is one who is lost in his ignorance because he never saw the truth. There's not one American on this soil, and I say it as a foreigner, who could tell God to his face, I never had an opportunity to accept you. There are more Christian radio stations in this country than there are islands in my nation. There are more Christian television stations in this country than we have television stations in our whole nation. There are more Christian publishing companies in this nation than we have houses in our country. You are belching of billions and billions and billions of tracts and books and records and music. No one in this nation can say they don't have a chance to hear God. This is not a pagan nation. It's rebellious. So God is not going to send miracles to entertain. The miracles are for us. Where the Buddhist needs to see the fire from heaven. Where the Muslim needs to see the fire from heaven. Where the animist needs to see the miracles of God and fall on his knees and say, Your God is the Lord. And that's exactly what's happening. We are seeing miracles that you wouldn't even want to print. Because people won't believe them. God's moved to the third world now. Ah, but he showed me something. There is a third world in America. And they're in this room. The French economists that coined the phrase third world defined a third world people as a people who did not benefit directly from the industrial revolution. That's the temporal definition. He's right. And there's a third world in America. It's their time now. And I've come here to tell you tonight, it's your time. But the question is, what is your purpose, God? Is it to have nice meetings? What is your purpose? Only the manufacturer knows the purpose for a product. So I want us to spend the last few moments finding out what the manufacturer says about the third world in America. Turn to Numbers chapter 10. Read this at your own risk. This is detrimental to your ignorance. Numbers chapter 10. <sighs> Please don't miss this. Now, if you don't know the purpose for a thing, you will what? Abuse it. The third one in America did not come to the open arms of the Statue of Liberty. They came to her back. Hello? They were not invited, they were bought.
But according to the manual, he came for a purpose. He creates nations for his purpose. So the question is, what is their purpose? Oh, I'm so glad you're here, my light-skinned friend. You are in the right place. This is not a racial message. This is a message of purpose. The third world man in America has been groping to find his purpose for hundreds of years. His identity was stripped. His reason for being was drowned. And so he danced to preoccupy his time. He knew exactly where he was, but didn't know why. According to the manual, I will give you what I am convinced about is a glimpse into his purpose. Numbers chapter 10 now to read this, you've got to really take a deep breath. This is awesome stuff. Moses, look at me a minute. Let's get the context. Moses was called of God, true? Anointed of God to bring the people out, true? He was given personal instructions, true? I mean, this man saw the glory of God on the bush, true? I mean, he had personal encounter with God, true? I mean, he heard the voice, didn't he? This guy was in charge. He went to Pharaoh. Did he have the anointing of God? Yes. You saw the miracles? Yes. He was the power of God on earth. There was no mistake God was with him. So Moses went in there, did what he had to do, wiped Pharaoh out, got the people out, and he brought them out into the wilderness. Who did all that for, for, for Moses? God. Now he got him in the, in the wilderness. But Moses is lost. Don't know his way to the wilderness. God told them exactly where they were going. He told them what was there. When they get there, milk and honey. He told them everything about Cain. But, but here's Moses with the free people. But he is here, the land is over there, and he can't get there because they don't know the way. Follow me. So Moses, in verse 29, says to Hobab, son of Ruel, the Midianite, Moses is father-in-law. Now, pause. Moses married a black woman. True? By the way, uh, God must have agreed with it because he never had an argument with him. And God used Moses more after he married a black woman than before he did. Come on, sit up straight now. God he had no problem with mixed marriages. Did they in the Bible? That destroys the path right out of the window. Turn over the page for one second, chapter 12, please. Verse 1, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife. For he had married a black woman from Africa. Turn back, please, chapter 10. Who had a problem with it? His sister and his brother, but not God. <laughs> so now Moses is now talking to this black man. I prophesy now. Moses says, 
We are setting out for the place about which God said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will treat you well for the Lord has promised good things to Israel. This was the first time in history that the church asked the black man to go with them. Answer. He answered, no. Why? I will not go. I am going back to my own people and my own country. Typical black man. <laughs> Selfish, thinking about himself only. Me, mine, and no one else's. It's called stingy. Way back there, thinking about himself. This is really not funny. You've got to hear the Spirit talk to you tonight. Because the next words that come from Moses' lips to me reveals the purpose for the dark-skinned man. Moses said to him, Please! Wait a minute, man. You've got to understand this. Moses was with God. He saw the bush burn. He had the plagues on Israel. He had the power of God with him. How come Moses is begging this guy just to cross a little piece of land? Let me tell you why. Because God's purposes will never change. No matter what you want to do. If you need me, God will not use a substitute. Some of you all ain't going to get this. The purpose for that man. Let me show you the purpose for the black man. Listen to me, you folks who ain't too black. <laughs> Moses said, please do not leave us. Why? Because you know the way through the rough desert. And you can be our eyes. I prophesy to you in the name of Jesus Christ that you are the eyes of the church and you still are. Now you really think that may be simple but do you know that Moses' statement is true? No one knows the rough stuff like us. No one being through the valley and the rocks. We know where the snakes are. We know where all the holes are. We know tough times. And Moses says, you know the way through the mess. No one can take it like you. If you don't take us, we can't go. And it's still true. Secondly, he says, you are our eyes. That joining geographically proven supposed to have been done in one month 40 days it took them 40 years because the black man said no 40 years is the number of a generation that means when the black man said no the first time the church was lost wandering around in the desert of life couldn't find their way, and they all died. I prophesy to you. This is it. I hear God asking one more. I see the church stumbling, blind. The stars are fallen. There's no more light. They can't see. They don't know what they're doing. They got the wealth. They got the buildings, they got the resources, 
They got the equipment, but they don't know where they're going. Can't you see the times? Can't you read the signs? They've got the money. They've got all the equipment. But they don't know where they're going. I prophesy that God is now moving and calling the man one more time. Every time he shows up, it's because God can't see. Jesus, on the way to the cross, blood in his eyes, he's blind. And guess who shows up? The eyes shows up. And the eyes took the cross. He says, I know the way to Calvary. And he stumbled all the way to Calvary. Whenever the church is lost, God looks for the eyes. And it's always a black man. Where was Peter when Jesus was blind? You folks who have joined higher dimensions, I tell you, you are in the right place at the right time. This has nothing to do with prejudice. It has nothing to do with color of skin. It has to do with the time. I prophesy that if you say no this time, you are going to cause the church to wander for 40 more years. Oh. Moses said, Moses said, please. Moses is begging a black man. He said, please. We can make it 40 days or 40 years. It's all in your hands. Please go with us. And he's saying one more time, I could hear them crying everywhere I travel. He said, please, you know what eyes are. Eyes are the ability to have vision. The church needs vision. They got everything but no vision. The TV programs, they ain't going nowhere. The crusades, there ain't nothing happening. The gospel music, just noise. Give us some vision. God is saying, give them the sight now. It's your time. It's time for you to stop following and lead now. It's time for you to stop listening and talk now. It's time for you. Oh, God. Stop borrowing and start lending now. Stop receiving. Start giving now. It's your time. You know, I tell you, a black man, and this is not a prejudice statement, it's a fact. A black man has such a high spiritual sensitivity, higher than any human I know. And I went to Africa, I was in Zimbabwe, and I went back to those villages, and those people are so spiritual. They're so spiritual, they pick up their ancestral spirits and demons. They, they love spiritual things. Even if it's wrong, they love it. They, they know how to get into it. Because God has given him an ability to see. To perceive. That's why when a black man gets anointed, he's a dangerous man. Don't you know that the Garden of Eden was in Africa? 
the Tishon River and the Euphrates River, the African River. Brother, you ain't just here to have a little meeting. God's called this thing. God said, all right, I want you to take over. I want you to start leading. I, I, I want you to, to walk in the footprints that are already there. He creates some new ones. I want to close with a scripture. Please, this is, this is rough on me. This is not the way I like to teach. I told you, this is rough. For two years, I've been pregnant with this thing. My people are free. Now my people got to be free. Dr. R. Roberts might be listening to this tape. He was just with me three days ago in my home. Came down to my country just to see what I was doing. Because he heard so much. Walked into the ministry, looked at me, and he said, my God, I could die now. I've seen my dream. I see the third world. You know, my people, it's not a rich country, all black. We're building a $2.8 million building. We're reaching 11 million people a day. We've been around for just over six years. We're in 26 countries, and I haven't even started yet. You know why? Because I have an acute awareness of my time. Now God's asking the question one more time in this generation. You've come from all over the United States. You caught buses and planes and drove together and carpooled. You didn't come here to hear some good message by some fiery preacher. God brought you here to kiss destiny. God brought you here to go back home and start making some plans. I charge you, Carlton. This time can't catch the bus. You can't catch a ride with nobody. You got to do this by yourself. Because you are now a president. You have to set a precedence. God gave you these men. You see what color they are? That's not funny. They know you could see. The last 20 years in America, I watched the church grow. It built big churches. The prosperity message came. The faith message came. The healing message came. And the church just got fat and fat. But they didn't know the purpose for nothing. So they consumed the wealth on themselves. They used the buildings as trophies. And they used the faith to get 
useless things. And God showed me that he did all that he did in the great big white church. Because he wanted them to provide resources for the third world. Now I prophesy, and you can take this or leave it, every church in this nation, and I speak it on television, every church in this nation that does not get in line and touch with what God's doing in the third world nations, that church shall suffocate in its own incubation. There's a third world in America. Do you understand? And let me just give some balance here. If you don't know the purpose for something, you'll abuse it. They didn't know the purpose for me. They didn't know the purpose for you. So they abused you. So you can't hate them. So I'm here to talk to both of you. No one can do without the other. They can't see without you. So relax if they hate you. Be cool if they close the doors. Don't get uptight if they turn their backs. They're blind. You are necessary. Each member, each joint, supply. <laughs> it's beautiful. So they've been walking into walls lately. Stubbing their toes lately. Having big meetings and nothing happening in them. Laying hands on the sick and no sick being healed. How many of you noticed? Calling big exciting meetings and nothing happens. Because they're forgetting the eyes. But not all of them. Some of them see. I better fall in line and take my position. Some of them see it. I better take my position. It's safer to be in God's purpose than to be in your prejudice. You look beautiful. You're in the right place. You're right where God's working. You're exactly where he's turned his eyes. And that's why your parents don't understand. And your cousins don't understand. Neither did Aaron's and neither did Miriam's. But you're in the right place. Stay where you planted. I want to close with this scripture. Two scriptures, actually. This is rough. Are you ready? Ready to go with me one more time? I want you to turn to the book of Psalm 68. Oh, 
told the prophecy tonight. I, I don't know if you even heard the prophecy. His mind knew nothing about what I was going to teach on. He doesn't know what I was pregnant with. And the man said, this is the night for Cushite. He didn't hear the prophecy. He says, I brought you here for destiny. He and I never met before. Never. First time we ever met. God called the conference, sir. But not for what you thought. You're in the middle of something big, boy. Big! It's touching Africa and Asia and Jamaica and India. Folks from Mexico, the third world people. They're not here by mistake. She didn't fly up here because he said it to come. It was following instructions, brother. And now it's time for Kush to send money on the mission fields. Because she's been receiving handouts too many times. Receivers now have to give. Psalm 68, if you will. Verse 31, it says, Envoys will come from Egypt. Cush will submit herself to God. <laughs> David says, David is a, is a politician. He ain't a priest. He's a king. But he saw something. He said, I can't explain this. He said, but I see Cush who worship demons. He says, I see Cush in envoys. That means in large groups coming to worship God. It's a prophecy. Was this fulfilled? Turn to Isaiah chapter 11. What you're about to read will be detrimental to your history. It's the day of Jesus. Verse 10. In that day, what day? The last days. The rule of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his place of rest will become glorious. In that day the Lord will reach out his hands a second time to reclaim the remnants that is left of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, and from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. Praise God, I'm in there somewhere. Turn over to chapter 18, Isaiah. Isaiah was a serious prophet. Isaiah saw stuff that we still don't understand. Isaiah says, if I tell you what I see, you ain't going to believe my report. Verse 7. At that time, same time again, in that day, at that time, gifts will be brought to the Almighty God from a people tall and smooth skinned. Now you got to figure out, you got to go study who they are. The Hebrew word is amazing, it means dark skin. A people who are tall and smooth skinned from a people fed far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech, whose land is divided by rivers. You know what that's referring to? Euphrates. They will bring gifts to the Mount of Zion, the place of the name of the Lord Almighty. Now you gotta understand that was prophesied by Isaiah. You gotta go back there thousands of years and put yourself in the context. It doesn't make sense to Isaiah. The Egyptians, they worship the sun. They worship the snake. They worship the moon. They, they don't worship God. He says, but I see them coming. He's prophesying. And they're going to come and bring gifts to God. They're going to come to Zion. They can come to the church. 
I love this. He says, they are an aggressive people. Let me say something very interesting here. The Holy Spirit ministered to me years ago. He says, you know, <laughs> these smooth-skinned people are aggressive. If Isaiah said it in prophecy, it got to be true. If I was Satan, and I heard this, I would destroy their aggression. He's done a good job. God is saying, get your aggression back. Because what's needed is going to require an aggressive spirit. Willing to take chances. Willing to fail on the way to success. Isaiah still prophesies. But he still doesn't understand what he prophesied. Look at it across the page. This is just what we want to end on. We're going to end on this. Look across the page. It says in verse 19 of chapter 19, you ain't going to believe what you read tonight. In that day. Everybody's in that day. How come we keep running into in that day? He's talking about a time, a season. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt. That doesn't make sense. Because he living at a time where there is no worship of God in Africa. Isaiah says, I see it. As sure as I live, there's going to be an altar unto Jehovah in the heart of the black man. And a monument to the Lord at its borders. It will be a sign and a witness. It's interesting. See, when this happened, that's a sign. Something is happening. To the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord because of their what? Oppressors. Now don't, 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 don't miss this now. He says they're going to cry out to the Lord under their oppressors. Now, some people think that, you know, they're talking about the Egyptians, I mean the Israelites. No, they're free. He's talking about these Cushites. We're going to read it in a minute. He says they will cry out to the Almighty God because of their oppressors. And he will send them a savior and a defender, and he will rescue them. So the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians, and in that day they will acknowledge the Lord. Are you following me? They will worship with sacrifices and grain offerings. They will make vows to the Lord and keep them. Everybody say, make vows and keep them. Make vows and keep them. I must have known something about us black folks. No one breaks vows like a black man. I know what I'm talking about. Tell a woman he'll never leave a night or forsake her. Break vows. Isaiah saw the thing. He said, but oh, in this day comes when God starts to move upon the Cushite. Suddenly, he's going to keep vows. Hallelujah. His marriage is going to work. His home's going to come back together. He's going to love his wife and be faithful. He's going to change. God's going to heal the family. Isaiah say, I saw it. He's going to keep vows again. He's going to be able to go into business with his brother and stay in business with his brother. Isaiah saw something else. 
It's a sad part. He says, the Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and then he will heal them. That sounds crazy. Isaiah prophesied. He's going to strike her with a plague and then he will heal her. He will strike her, then he will heal her. It doesn't make sense. That means he'll do something, then he'll undo it. Read on. He will strike them and heal them. They will turn to the Lord after that and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. In that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to understand this is a strange prophecy. Everything usually went from Assyria to Egypt. Some of y'all ain't going to get this till I leave. I know it. <laughs> Highways in the Old Testament usually represent symbolically of messengers. Travelers. Traveling with message. He says the day will come when there will be messengers coming from Egypt. They're calling for me. Some of you all ain't going to get this. Could you believe revelation is coming from Egypt? Yeah. You mean they got something to offer? Yes. <laughs> There's a highway from Egypt now. There's something good in the ghetto. God's raising up some great young men and women in the ghetto. You, you, you just haven't met them yet. Thousands of them. It's just time. The Assyrians will go to Egypt. Why well, is prophecy? The guy prophesying. That's not just a story. He prophesying. The Assyrians will go well off. They're going to go to Egypt. Egypt will have something to offer now. The Egyptians and the Assyrians will worship together. Lift your hands and just wave before the Lord. You see the prophecy? See the Egyptians and the Assyrians? It's happening. See? It's time. Don't close your Bible yet. You got to read one more line. In that day, everybody say in that day. In that day. Some of you all ain't never been in church this long. You got to hear the word of the Lord before we go back to our countries and our states. In that day, Israel will be third. Does that make sense to you? You never read that before. Israel will be third along with Egypt and Assyria. Israel used to be number one. God says, no. When that time comes, Egypt is going to be first. <laughs> the last shall be first. Even over the chosen. And it's, it's with no one's permission. Isaiah says, God says he's going to do it. So what to do is just join him. Oh Lord. Carlton. Read this with me, please. Isaiah chapter 45. And now we're going to pray. Do you know? Are you aware? That I used to hate the fact 
that they brought me over on ships and dumped me on the islands and I worked the cane fields. Do you know I used to despise that? And I thought God did me a terrible injustice. But I didn't know it was prophesied. Isaiah chapter 45. Verse 14. This is what the Lord says. Who's saying this? Lord. The Lord. The products of Egypt. Guess who that is? He didn't say Egypt, but the products of it. Offspring. That's you. He said the products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush. It's the children of slaves. He says, and those tall Sabians, there's those tall, dark-skinned fellas show up again. Hiya says, I see something. They will come over to you and will be yours. They will trudge behind you coming over in chains. Sweetheart, this ain't no time not to read your Bible. I'm going to read it again. The products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush. They will come over behind you, trudging behind you, coming over to you in chains. That sounds negative. I'll read the next line. They will bow down before you and plead with you saying, surely God is with you and there is no other. There is no other God. Let me tell you what Isaiah saw. Isaiah saw. The only way God could get them to meet him is to tear them away from ancestral worship and demon worship. I, I can't explain it any better. The only way to get us free from our demon worship, I'm so glad I came from Africa. He says, when they come and change, they're going to meet me. He says, I want them to meet me because they're the eyes. And right now, the eyes got cataracts with demon worship. They're blind in witchcraft and ancestral worship. He says, and I need eyes for my church. And if it means that I got to put chains on them and drag them to meet me, they're going to meet me, he says. You know, God showed me, brother. He said, brother, he said, my son, who says that you would not still have been worshiping evil spirits if you didn't come over? It was the change that set me free. It's kind of Worship the Lord. Lift your hands, worship the Lord. Assyria and Egypt, lift up your hands. Oh, Korabasamatabada. Just thank Him for setting you free today. You are the eyes. And the Church of America needs you. The Church of America needs you. They can't do it without you. You got something that they need, and they got something you need. Everybody need each other. Come on, lift your hands and accept your position. Isaiah said, remain standing, Isaiah said, when Cush shall lift her hands up toward the Lord, then the Lord will deliver her. Do you know what God is saying? You've been reaching your hands toward everybody else. Welfare. Green stamps. The white man. God said, would you please lift them up to me? Hallelujah. 
worship God. Come on, Assyria. Yes, the Lord. Let the body of Christ come back together.
unto thee this night, my son. For this purpose, you were born. For this purpose, you've been called. For this reason, I've brought thee unto this city, saith thy God. For even when one of my man's servants in the beginning of time, the beginning of this decade, came forth with the song, yes. It was a prophetic call unto a people to come forth into their place. Yea, I've raised thee up, saith thy God, to carry that tune even into this generation. I've brought thee in an area where man said you should have not made it. I've raised thee up in circles that they said you ought not be. But for this purpose I've called thee, saith the Lord. And now you are coming into the place, and I bring thee now to the valley of dry bones, and I will cause you to prophesy and to bring forth this army, saith the Lord. For this night I've begun a healing, saith thy God, and that which you have toiled with, and that which you wrestled with, and the discontent, and the unrest that has been there, and the unfairness, but the Lord would say, it was the making of a general that I was bringing forth, saith the Lord. For I will not only do a work in thee, but I shall do a work in this fellowship. I shall even change the name of the fellowship, saith the Lord, and it shall spread throughout the land, across the nation, and around the world. For you shall not lift up thine hands in thine own strength no more from this night forward. But as I have assigned men unto thee that are lifting now thy hands, saith the Lord, I bring them and join them unto thee. For thy half-brother, as I said, ha 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 that mock thee, shall now be joined unto thee. And covenant shall be established and rekindle again. You have been called to carry the baton at the close of this century and to open up the next century with a glorious awakening for you are one of a many, saith the Lord. Fulfill thy purpose and fulfill thy call. For I raise thee up as a Samuel in the house of Eli. Give sight to Eli. Give sight to Eli. Eli calleth for thee in the night season. Give sight unto him. For thou art a voice in the land being raised up. For this night brought a new beginning of that prophetic call and that apostolic anointing. And you shall go forth and you shall establish. No more wrestling, for the healing has begun. And this night I make thee whole, said the Spirit of the Lord. Speak unto my church. Speak to my people. And the word of the Lord would even come unto thee this night, even as a people. The word that I sent unto thee is not a word that would exalt thee one above another, but it is a word that I begin to define thy part in the body. For does the foot say that it is greater than the arm? And does the arm say that it is greater than the thigh? For each part has its distinction. And this night I revealed thy distinction unto thee. Humble thyself and watch me exalt thee. For if thou would rise up in a supremest attitude, you will move in the same spirit of your half-brothers. But I will say unto thee tonight, understand the word of the Lord. Move in the designed and designated part of the body that I fault thee. For one is not greater than the other, but there's a distinction in part. And this night, I identify thee for purpose in my kingdom, saith the Spirit of the living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. last thing please don't try to make commentary or explanation just be still and listen the Holy Spirit will bring clarity to all of us I must make this one statement and we'll all leave and I'll express myself tomorrow since 1972 of November November of 1972 I have carried the essence of what was shared tonight afraid to even address it except little hints here and there for specific reasons and um, I wanted Bishop Ida Hosa to speak tonight because he so much embraces the embodiment of the prophetic word that came forth tonight I've been to him and he just did not come. He just would not come. And he, I have such a health of respect for him. He's a man of God. And when we found out he, he would not come, and he hears from God, he did not give me a reason why. He just did not come. Because Miles was to be here. Bishop last night said we don't know who Carlton is did you remember him saying that I know but I couldn't tell you I did not even have the guts to say what he said because I walked so carefully for the last 20 years so carefully Never wanting to turn the people off that God has, has brought me to and through. And the white church opened up with arms, if you understand what I mean when I say the white church. And received. And the people God has surrounded me with. I walk so carefully. And now the Lord has spoken. It's time now. And it's safe. And it will be understood by the ones who would understand it. And we will be a people of God. Please be prayerful all day tomorrow. Go by and get the whole tape package of his teachings. If you think this is something, I don't, I don't care what you hear Miles teach, it'll be as profound. So don't think this is special. All of his teaching is from God. He's a little black man that I recognized years ago on this campus, destined for greatness. I feel like a little boy when I hear him speak. I love you. Until we meet again. There's a book titled Chosen But Not Cursed. I was going to present it tomorrow tonight. Pick this book up, Chosen But Not Cursed, by Jeffrey Edwards. Go to the bookstore and get it. Chosen But Not Cursed. I'll take it with you. God bless you. Go ahead.